So I'm really delighted to welcome you to this um, first lecture, live lecture, as part of the Laudato Si Research Institute's um, visiting fellowship, Dennis Edwards Fellowship, um, uh, uh, that we are, we're holding here at the at Campion Hall LSRI. And I have to say that Dennis Edwards was a very dear colleague and a particular friend of mine. And when, so when he passed away, very sadly, we felt we really needed to do something. And so these, this fellowship has been inaugurated in his memory. And I believe that he is, his spirit is here with us. He, he can't be here in person, obviously, but his generosity, his warmth, his openness to inquiry, his commitment to eco-theology and uh, the engagement with the sciences is all part of what we're going to hear tonight. Um, and he was, of course, a, a pioneer in that uh, engagement and a very important contributor to the movements within the Catholic Church for ecological conversion in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. This lecture couldn't be more appropriate. It's given by Dr. Alda Balthrop Lewis on what to give up for the climate, asceticism and ecological justice. And she is our second Dennis Edwards Fellow. Um, but because of COVID, our first one uh, had to be online. So we're really delighted to have Alda here in person this year. She is currently Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Religion and Critical Inquiry at the Australian Catholic University, where her research focuses on religion and the environment, and where she also knew Dennis Edwards as a colleague. Her first book, Thero's Religion, Walden Woods, Social Justice and the Politics of Asceticism, which came out with Cambridge University Press in 2021, treats Henry David Thero as an inheritor of traditional ascetic practices and it argues that his asceticism is politically relevant and this is a topic that's going to come up again tonight, both in his period and for contemporary environmental ethics. Her ongoing research, which she also will feature in this um, lecture, is about Thomas Merton's turning towards the world. The transformation in his thinking about the significance of monasticism in the 1950s through to the 1960s. So Alda interprets Thomas Merton as an inheritor of Thero's religion. And in tonight's public lecture, she'll explore the political significance of asceticism in the work of both Thoreau and Merton, suggesting that their work offers lessons for contemporary struggles for justice. So it couldn't be more appropriate for our institute, it couldn't be more appropriate in memory of Dennis Edwards. I can't wait to hear you, um, Alda, thank you so much for coming, all of you, and for those online as well, and for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Celia, and to the LSRI more broadly, um, your support and the support of the Faculty of Theology and Philosophy at Australian Catholic University to be here is um, tremendous, and I'm really happy about it. It's such a pleasure to be um, doing this work in a thriving community of scholarship. Um, it means a lot also to hold the fellowship in Dennis Edwards' name. He was a lovely, lovely man. And I met him for the first time at a conference on the papal, en papal encyclical, Laudato Si, at a conference hosted by Australian Catholic University in 2015. I was still a graduate student. I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to go on to be his colleague at ACU. And he stands as an example to so many of us, I think, for the for the way that he helped to advance the cause of ecological conversion in the Catholic Church and in theology, more broadly even. So in Australia, where Dennis Edwards was from and where I normally live, it's customary at the beginning of any public event to acknowledge the country on which we meet. The word country in this Australian English idiom is what we call the land when we mean to include its spiritual significance, its important relational connections. As I've come to understand the custom of acknowledgement of country at the beginning of public events um, in Australia, the custom is both in continuity and discontinuity with long-standing indigenous practice on that continent. 
Before British settlement of Australia, indigenous nations maintained peaceable boundaries for many tens of thousands of years, in part through customs of seeking and offering welcome across territorial boundaries. Their political, cultural, and ecological practices, including these practices of seeking and offering welcome, have maintained the Earth's oldest continuous human cultures. It's an amazing fact. In continuity with those practices in contemporary Australia, at the beginning of public events, we mark the country on which we meet, saying, for example, where I usually live on Wurundjeri country in Melbourne, I acknowledge that we are meeting today on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respect to their elders. However, as a non-Wurundjeri person myself, having immigrated to Melbourne eight years ago from the United States, I cannot, of course, offer welcome to someone else's country. Thus, a massive discontinuity in the practice, at least when done by people at, like me. At the beginning of public events, we who are not indigenous to the country on which we gather acknowledge that country rather than offering welcome to it. And we take a moment to remember that we meet on land whose sovereignty was never ceded to the Australian nation. I have come to value this practice very much, and so I've been puzzling over how to do it here. The practice of publicly acknowledging the land on which we meet. There is so much history in Oxford. Dennis Edwards argued almost 40 years ago in 1986 that Christians in Australia should consider themselves what he called apprentices to Aboriginal views of the land. I have taken Edward's advice to heart, and I do consider myself an apprentice to Aboriginal views of the land. Experts in indigenous knowledge systems like Tyson Yunka Porta, indigenous land management like Victor Stephenson, indigenous theology like Gary Deverall, and Aboriginal political theory like Mary Graham are transforming my own understanding of human responsibilities in the context of our ecological communities. The land on which we meet today here in Oxford, in England, in the United Kingdom, erstwhile seat of empire, has a much different ecological and colonial history to Wurundjeri country in Melbourne, where I live. And yet this land still calls out for our care. One of the many reasons I'm grateful to be here at the LSI, LSRI this term is to have the opportunity to observe the ways that your work is considering what kind of care this land requires. So that was a long introduction because I care about thinking about what land we're on and don't know how to do it here. This will be a talk about ascetic contemplative traditions of Christian life and the ways those traditions might be related to environmental politics. Asceticism, as that practiced in monasteries, is a bit of an obsession of mine. I'm enamored of the idea that humans have found ways to build peaceable communities founded on economic equality and productive cooperation with the ecologies in which they are set. In communities like these ones that obsessed me, members have successfully disciplined themselves to a life shaped by just labor and praise for God. This obsession runs in other directions too, and since moving to Australia, it has run towards these examples of indigenous cultural traditions, which have been ongoing there for at least 65,000 years. They're likely the Earth's oldest, most stable cultural, religious, and ecological traditions. As Bruce Pascoe has described in Dark Emu, Pre-colonial Aboriginal nations lived within peaceable boundaries, managed fire for agricultural purposes, raised food sustainably, and followed the law of the land. But while following Dennis Edwards, I consider myself an apprentice to those traditions, they are not mine. I have a European-American heritage characterized by a history of colonization and empire. I have ancestors on both sides of this history, some who were empire builders and others who were subjected to imperial domination, and some people, I think, just caught in the middle. But I have to say, it's a less inspiring story than the indigenous ones I have been learning in Australia. Still, 
I nonetheless think that Christian traditions have promise for those of us who are, like me, searching for wisdom about human possibilities for egalitarian communities, just labor, productive cooperation with our habitats, and a life built around praise. After all, Christians worship a God unjustly sacrificed at the hands of imperial power, whose last act was to serve an egalitarian meal at which all shared in the produce of the land. And there are resources, I think, in that tradition that describe the attempts Christians have made to follow his example, to reject unjust economies, and to establish cooperative communities in peace. So this is a talk about the ascetic, contemplative tradition of Christian life, in which I argue that ascetic traditions are sometimes a kind of politics for just economy. In this, they are also, I think, traditions with insight about what ecological justice might require. So the shape of this time that we're spending together has three kind of sections. First, I'm going to describe a big question that drives my work and some of the stuff I've done up to now on that, especially in the Thoreau book. Second, I'm going to situate that question in a longer Christian tradition, story about other kinds of Christian asceticism. And third, I'm going to describe how, that, uh, how the project I'm working on now about Thomas Merton responds to this big question. So first, the big question. Both my first book, which is about Henry David Thoreau, and my current project on Thomas Merton are driven by this one central question. What are the political implications of ascetic practice? I take it that asceticism refers to forms of spirituality that are often characterized by renunciation or other spiritual exercises. In Christian theological traditions, especially traditions of monasticism and religious life, asceticism is often given shape by three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And these vows help to form a life dedicated to prayer and labor. Those who do not practice such asceticism tend to think of it as rather foreign these days. I mean, I've tried to teach these texts to undergraduates, and they're like, what? Um, the modern worries about asceticism are extremely diverse. But the negative view of asceticism that interests me most is the idea that asceticism is bad for the world. According to this view, all ascetic practice does is offer its practitioners reassurance that they're good without actually doing any good. It's a sort of virtue signaling. They think practically, how on earth would my self-denial benefit you or the community that I am part of to the extent that I convince myself my ascetic practice is good, these skeptics think, I excuse myself from the actually good work I could do for my community. And in this way, asceticism is a form of political quietism. Under this view, asceticism acknowledges that there are problems in human society that need to be addressed, it aims to address them, but it is so ineffective that its ultimate result is support for the status quo. By refusing to engage with the world, ascetics give the world up to the suffering it currently holds. My view is that asceticism can be quietist in this sense. We have examples in which it has been. And it can also not be, depending on the practice and the context. My first book, uh, which Celia mentioned, Thoreau's Religion, asks about the politics of asceticism in the life and thought of Henry David Thoreau, a figure that people in the late 20th century academy did not usually recognize was invested in religion or theology. Thoreau was a 19th century author from the United States who wrote what became a famous book, Walden, and who became a kind of saint for the environmental movement. Scholars in English, history, politics, and philosophy have tended to ignore Thoreau's interest in religion, and scholars in religious studies and theology are only beginning to notice the ways in which Thoreau participated in and shaped theological traditions that came before and after him. Some readers of Thoreau have wondered if he ought to have the saintly status he sometimes holds among those with environmental concern. Thoreau's book, Walden, and its emphasis on living the simple life in nature has sometimes been taken as a paradigmatic icon 
for an environmentalism of the rich, one that tends to ignore the intersection of empire, race, gender, and economic injustice with environmental harm. In this sense, Thoreau seems a very unlikely contributor to thinking about environmental justice in some ways. I take this term environmental justice to usually be used to describe environmental ethics and politics that can coordinate social and ecological concern. My book, which offers a new interpretation of Walden, suggests that to the extent Thoreau's legacy for environmentalism has been apolitical and lacking in consciousness of empire, class, race, and gender, along with other forms of systemic injustice, that legacy has been the result of a misreading of some of Thoreau's most important work. For Thoreau, nature piety, the kind he expressed in Walden, was integrally tied to the pursuit of justice. And we see this especially clearly when we do better at reading his religion. And perhaps surprisingly, his vision of religious simplicity, which has sometimes been read as overly austere, as asceticism often is, I think, was more deeply invested in delight than in sacrifice for its own sake. Throw models what I describe in the book as political asceticism, which is to say asceticism that is driven by a political commitment to just economy, including ecological flourishing for all beings. My work on Thoreau demonstrates, I hope, that Thoreau's ascetic religious practice was conceptually and practically tied to his politics against slavery, against industrial capitalism, and against wars for territorial expansion. Voluntary poverty, he thought, this is a weird idea, could contribute to new forms of just economy and government. Asking about the politics of asceticism with an open mind is itself, I think, a contribution both to theology and to the study of religion writ large. Too often, ascetic life has been characterized as first wholly negative and self-denying, and second, as retreating from politics. Of course, the last, say, 50 years have seen scholars across academic fields, from Michel Foucault to Sarah Coakley, correct the first point about asceticism's being self-denying, but especially by drawing attention to the positive self-formation ascetic practices often pursue. They're not just negative, they're also forming persons. This corrective, sometimes I think, though, has its own distorting consequences because in the focus it places on individual formation, it can obscure the constructive significance ascetic practices have had with respect to wider social, political, and economic worlds of which individual practitioners are a part. Attention to the context out of which ascetic practice is born often uncovers that the practices in question are not only formative for the practitioner, but arise out of and feed back into the society from which the practitioner withdraws. In this way, my work aims to uncover the broader social significance of ascetic practice. So now the second section of this talk, which is uh, about how this research question about the political implications of ascetic practice is related to other Christian ascetic traditions. Thoreau's political asceticism was related to a longer set of Christian traditions. He knew that his asceticism was drawing upon ancient forms. He made jokes about Cenobites. The joke is about when he goes fishing and he sees no bites, but it's also a joke about monks. He, not all of his jokes play in the 21st century. <laughs> The word, uh, of course, Cenobites describes monks who live in communities as opposed to living as solitary hermits. Uncovering Thoreau's asceticism, I think, can show us one way in which the influence of these old Christian traditions has been wider than we usually see. One of my main aims in the Thoreau book, though I think it's uh, subterranean, was to show one place where the roughly Thomistic common good tradition stretches further than either theorists of liberal democracy or communitarians usually notice. And seeing the ways in which Thoreau's asceticism was drawing ascetic life toward just politics has helped me to think again about ascetic traditions of religious life that came before and after him. <laughs> 
the tendency to view contemplative life and its attendant renunciations apart from their broader contexts, of course, affects views of more traditional Christian ascetics too. Even people who admire the theologians and religious brothers and sisters who gave shape to Christian asceticism often depoliticize these figures. They take them as contemplative geniuses, neglecting, sometimes, the radical economic critique at the heart of apostolic living. So, for an example appropriate to this context, take Lynn White's appeal to St. Francis of Assisi in a famous article from 1967. That article, which many of you know, I'm sure, the historical roots of our ecological crisis, has had an enormous impact on the way the academic study of religion and ecology has developed, including among theologians. Famously, White attributed dominative views of nature to Christian theology, and he offered, as an antidote, Francis of Assisi. White described Francis as a spiritual revolutionary whose view of nature as a co-equal part of creation would have brought about a different history, a more ecologically friendly one, if it had been the theology of nature adopted in the West. But in focusing on Francis's theology of nature, to the exclusion of his practice of poverty, White contributed, I think, to a long history in which Francis's poverty has been depoliticized. What White didn't describe, which makes Francis even more important for our time than White described, was that like the other poverty movements of the period, Francis did not only have a different view of nature, he pushed back against the accumulation of wealth that was shaping the power structures of Europe and driving economic injustice. The current environmental movement, when it is successful, is less and less about doctrines of nature, important as those are, and more and more about achieving the democratic political power required to push back against the accumulation of capital by exploitative industries. We should remember that Francis had something to say about accumulated wealth, too. Before Francis of Assisi, Benedict's rule was, as one of my students once pointed out in class, preoccupied with the practical matters required for people coming from different class positions to live together peaceably. Teresa of Avila founded her first convent at San Jose in strict poverty, conscientiously following the reform, reform movements of Francis's period. She enacted egalitarianism among the sisters who joined her. She rejected standard ways religious orders of her period made money. She did not require dowries. She insisted that all her religious houses be economically self-sufficient. Rowan Williams wrote that Teresa's teaching insisted, quote, we must become strangers to the tyrannies of honor and dignity. The ascetic life in a community of equals initiates this process and teaches us a new solidarity with the dispossessed and powerless. The tradition of Christian spirituality represented by these figures and their ascetic practice has an economic critique at its heart. When Jesus told the rich man that he would have to sell everything he had in order to inherit eternal life, Mark's gospel tells us that his face fell and he went away sad. Jesus told the disciples how hard it would be for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, and then he finished the speech explaining, many who are first will be last, and the last first. This prophetic critique of wealth runs right through the tradition of Christian spirituality. But elite theological scholarship, sometimes, like the rich man, has a tendency to ignore the message. And in an age where wealth and its pursuit seems to be killing life on earth, it's a feature of the gospel we could do to remember. Where scholarly writing about the geniuses of contemplation neglects the social, economic, and political significance of their poverty, it spiritualizes, in the bad sense, the great contemplatives and ignores the important economic critique that was so often enmeshed in their contemplative practice. The life of poverty that Jesus lived, that the monastic tradition is always being called back to, that Thoreau drew upon in his ecological classic, also continually speaks a new word against political domination and economic exploitation. <laughs>
So now to this third part about what I'm working on now. Mm. This work continues to ask the big question that's driving my research, the question that I began with, what are the political implications of ascetic practice? But my current project focuses on a figure who draws together the long story of Christian asceticism I described in the second section with the particular insight of Thoreau that I uncovered in my first book, that love of nature and social justice are part of the same practice. The project aims to uncover resources for the contemporary pursuit of integral ecology, as it was called in Laudato Si, which I take to indicate a theology of the natural world that integrates social concerns. And it does this through an exploration of the life and thought of Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was a 20th century Trappist monk, an author and an heir of Henry David Thoreau's political asceticism. Like Thoreau, Merton saw contemplative life and social and political movements for justice as deeply related. I can talk more about Thoreau's specific influence on Merton in questions if you like, but despite Merton's own best efforts, he has also been a victim, I think, of the tendency to see as merely contemplative the apostolic life of poverty, and thus to silence its attendant economic, social, and political critique. Merton's own superiors seem to have fallen prey to such an understanding of the life of contemplation when they forbade him for a time from writing about war, which was one of his central theological and political concerns. His impression at the time was that, as he wrote to Robert Giroux, it is, quote, a kind of scandal for a contemplative monk to be known to follow world events. This dynamic in contemplative life that it is sometimes viewed as otherworldly and unrelated to more mundane political concerns was thus familiar to Merton. And many of his writings insisted that monasticism was not disconnected from the broader political and social world. Especially in the late 1950s and early 60s, he began to realize, he changed his mind really, how deeply social justice was tied to the life of contemplation. His spiritual classic from 1949, Seeds of Contemplation, was republished in 1961 as New Seeds of Contemplation, and the revision addressed head-on the concern that contemplation has an otherworldly image. The preface to the new version suggested that the word itself, contemplation, is, quote, misleading in many respects. And it even raised the possibility that a proper revision would have excised the word from the text. So this book that was called Seeds of Contemplation might need to have the word contemplation removed from the whole thing in order to avoid this misapprehension. Much of the additional material in the revised book aimed to correct these problems that Merton worried readers might experience. The chapter entitled Solitude is Not Separation suggested that deliberate solitude was in fact for fellowship, both with God and with other humans. Merton wrote, the only justification for a life of deliberate solitude is the conviction that it will help you to love not only God, but also other men. Merton's way of loving both God and other men, as he said, has special significance for theology now. It is a commonplace in environmental studies to point out that the environmental movement of the 20th century was often tightly bound to racial and social hierarchies. In the United States, for instance, which is the context in which I know this political history best, many of the canonical white thinkers of the classic conservation movement, figures like John Muir and Aldo Leopold, were either inattentive to, or in some cases in league, with white supremacist understandings of human nature. The early environmental movement in the States was often implicitly understood as a conversation among elite white people and one that too often neglected social injustice along lines of race and class that persisted all around them. It was not until the late 1980s that environmentalists of that sort began to re realize how tightly tied social, economic, and racial inequities were to environmental inequities. In the years since, the movement that can keep its eye on both ecological concerns and the social, economic, and racial inequities that travel alongside them has come to be called the environmental justice movement in some places. And much work in environmental studies has focused on the reformation required to build a more inclusive environmental politics. In this context, Merton's own attention to both 
racism in America and the new and growing ecological consciousness of the period are, I think, instructive and prescient. I'm just going to give you two examples of moments in which Merton exhibited the sense that these two political issues were part of one spiritual and theological problem. So first, in his last published essay, which was a review of Roderick Nash's Wilderness and the American Mind in 1968, Merton wrote that humans without right relationships to the natural world are perverted into purveyors of American injustice. A man like this enacts what Merton called, quote, the sin of the white man. He wrote that such a man, apart from a sacramental relationship to nature, becomes sinful wherever he lives or works. He wrote, quote, in a ghetto, he is a policeman shooting every black man who gives him a dirty look. In this way, Merton seemed to integrate concern for environmental wholeness and racial injustice, two concerns that race and class segregation in America often cast as divergent. He did this because he thought that love for God's creatures could be whole. Too often in contemporary economic understandings of environmental problems, the interests of humans, conceived as a uniform class, get pitted against the interests of broader ecological communities. This rhetorical form usually fails to name the fact of wealth inequality among humans as part of exploitative economies that are also the cause of ecological harm. Merton resisted this picture, believing that the competitive picture, the one pitting humans against nature, was itself part of a spiritual sickness. So the second example I'm going to share with you is from his journal in 1962, when in reflecting on having read Rachel Carson, he wrote about his own environmental concern, that it was on behalf of both nature and humanity as an integral part of it. He wrote, someone will say, you worry about birds, why not worry about people? I worry about both birds and people. We are in the world and part of it. And we are destroying everything because we are destroying ourselves, spiritually, morally, and in every way. It is all part of the same sickness, and it all hangs together. So my work in this current project is to uncover the theological and spiritual motivation for Merton's belief that, as he wrote, it all hangs together. Such work, I hope, can enable the church's pursuit of the integral ecology that Pope Francis called for in Laudato Si. It can show that environmental justice has a longer history than is usually told, and it may show ways in which ascetic contemplative life can offer alternatives to the economic vision that drives contemporary environmental exploitation and social injustice of other kinds. So in conclusion, it's kind of a long conclusion, um, I'm going to summarize first. I've tried to do three things. So I described a big question that drives much of my research. What are the political implications of ascetic practice? Second, I suggested that asking that question of the long history of Christian asceticism might yield some interesting results. And third, I began to sketch the way in which my current project on Thomas Merton can draw together some of the Therovian insights of my first book, with this much longer religious tradition. The advertised title for this talk was What to Give Up for the Climate. I fear that title may have been false advertising. I have not explained which of your carbon intensive activities you should stop, which you can excuse, for which you should pay the advertised carbon offsets. I suppose each of us must discern these things for ourselves within the constraints and opportunities we find in our own contexts. But it may be that the question itself is often a distraction from the most important ecological and political facts. I recently read an article written by a school teacher in Oregon titled, Ecological Footprint Calculators Are Bad for the Environment. In it, Ursula Wolf Roca outlined why an activity that asks 14-year-olds to reduce their individual consumption is a distraction. She wrote, 
The activity left my students feeling vaguely guilty, even ashamed. But that shame should not be theirs to carry. My students did not build this world. And the footprint calculator does nothing to help them ask who did. Why is it shaped as it is? And how it might be redesigned and rebuilt more justly? The footprint calculator foregrounds so-called choices while obscuring their social determinants. Wolf Roca is pointing out that asking what each of us ought to give up for the climate may in some cases misrepresent the political work we have to do to build a more just society. But the fact that Thoreau's retreat to Walden Woods and Merton's life at the Abbey of Gethsemane are not blueprints for a modern, ecologically sustainable economy does not mean, I think, that traditions of asceticism are irrelevant to contemporary environmental politics. As my work aims to show, these traditions have often been oriented by a bigger vision of justice than the blueprint calculator imagines, and by a hope for a way of life that can enact such justice. More than offering the most efficacious means to a sustainable economy, which they do not for our economies, they constitute a sort of prefigurative politics, aiming to convince us that we can transform our lives and demonstrating that such transformations can be good for us. As a person fascinated with these ascetic monastic traditions, I am sympathetic to the longing for a new Benedict that Alistair McIntyre expressed at the end of After Virtue in 1981, and that seems to have become pervasive in the years since. It is true that, as McIntyre worried, the specters of individualism and the culture of material success haunt the lives of even the most prayerful Christians. Thoreau and Merton would be sympathetic to these concerns too, I think. But figures like Thoreau and Merton can also help us to take a different view on the relevance of the monastic tradition, whose ascetic spirituality need not yield a defensive gesture meant, to especially, meant especially to protect the Christian's own virtue and to draw us inward toward one another. Rather than creating enclaves like those sometimes promoted among contemporary purveyors of a Benedict option, I think we should remember that even the ascetic gesture has often been a response to and an agential force in a much wider world. And if this is the case, we might find a different lesson in the ascetic tradition that if contemplatives face this broader world with a hospitable gesture, we should too. Thoreau and Merton, both deeply contemplative, exhibited this kind of hospitality. While solitary by character, they both also spent much of their living trying to expand their understanding of the world beyond their solitude, and they were committed to doing what they could to promote a wider justice. Thoreau realized that drawing upon other religious traditions in his own life was a gift. Merton saw that engagement with non-Christian materials and people would enrich his faithful response to the God who, as he saw it, had created all. This is why my own work seeks both to live within the theological tradition, in a way, drawing on the wealth of Christian heritage, and to bring resources back into that tradition that may well enrich it in a much changed future. Because my work aims to describe Merton in this way, it will sometimes seem far from what scholars are accustomed to calling eco-theology, I think. In the planned chapters of my current project, which are organized around Merton's reading of other 1960s thinkers, only one, Rachel Carson, is usually counted among environmental thinkers. None are Christian theologians. And yet, this may be a problem with what gets counted as eco-theology or environmental thought, rather than an accurate rendering of the importance of these thinkers to it. Among them, Hannah Arendt, James Baldwin, William Melvin Kelly, and Rachel Carson. All of them cared about a sustainable, life-giving future for our worlds. My book will explain how they transformed Thomas Merton's understanding of contemplation and what that understanding of contemplation has to teach us. I hope this work will also honor the memory of Dennis Edwards, the theologian and priest and teacher for whom this fellowship is named. As early as 1974, 
Edward suggested Australian contextual theology, as he was calling for, ought to take up the theme of dispossession, which he glossed as letting go of the attempt to grasp and clutch at what we have no right to possess. He was clear that this was particularly important among the elite in wealthy societies like Australia. He wrote, we find ourselves living in abundance while others die because they have nothing. We know that there is a real and direct connection between the fact that we have so much and they have so little. It is because we have used economic, political, and military power to grab more than our share of what is available. The importance of dispossession in Christian life was for him also a political insight, a call not only to a personal spirituality, but also to a politics that would support the most vulnerable among us. I am honored to have been invited to hold this fellowship in his name, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alda, for that absolutely wonderful lecture, and, and it's uh, and I'm I'm quite convinced that Dennis Edwards would be um, singing from heaven as he wa <laughs> watches what's going on here. So he really uh, had a way of tying in his thinking on dispossession with um, Merton, and then also with Thoreau in a, in a wonderful tapestry that I'm sure we all find absolutely fascinating. Thank you. So. Now there's time for some questions, and I'm going to, I will start off by inviting those from the floor, if they have any, if you raise your hand, um, and, then, uh, and then we'll look to the, to the online questioners. So I'm sure, um, having heard such a, a stimulating and quite radical talk, um, there'll be plenty of questions to, to come out. So anyone like to kick us off? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your, can you hear me? Thank you for your talk. It was fascinating. Um, just to start, what was your decision making in choosing those two? And were there others that you maybe considered writing about instead? Thank you so much. Um, so let's see, what's the story about this? I, um, the Thoreau book has, came out of my PhD dissertation. And I went into the PhD knowing that I wanted to work on the politics of nature, but not really knowing much more about it. I did a PhD in religion at Princeton University, and I took a seminar there that was taught by Jeffrey Stout and Cornell West that was really amazing um, on the essay tradition, sort of a long story about writing essays and, and what they've been for in the history of literature and politics. And Thoreau was one of the figures in this course. I ended up writing a paper for that course about Thoreau. I'd never read Walden before. Um, but incredibly, uh, as is not usually told about Thoreau, Walden Woods, people imagine Walden Woods as kind of a, a wilderness place. But Walden Woods had been occupied in the generation before Thoreau by people who had been enslaved and conquered. And so when Thoreau went to live in those woods, it had been, I think, only about 25 years since the last of those people had been living there. And he knew that. So I take him in the book to have taken those people as an example of what enacting freedom looks like. Um, and that, I think, makes, makes his decision to live there look quite different. Um, and then I learned from a teacher, I was just saying, also at Princeton, a historian of African American religion, Al Rabito, who was an amazing, amazing person. Um, he wrote a beautiful book called Slave Religion. Uh, I learned from him that Merton had received this letter from Henry Miller once in which Henry Miller said to Merton, you're like the transcendentalist. And Merton wrote back and said, I will try to be worthy of that. And when I learned that from Al Rabito, I just sort of decided that I needed to go further in thinking about the connections between the transcendentalism, a, a reimagined version of what transcendentalism might mean in the 19th century context and how drawing that forward into a 20th century American context, what, what, what does that kind of transcendentalism, the, the one that I tried to describe in Thoreau's religion, look like when we see it in the 20th century? Those are some of the reasons. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Like considered, considered, and just maybe some like were there women or people from like uh, like other continents or yeah um, yeah yep. So because my own work has been focused so much on American literature, I work mostly on people writing in America. Um, that's 
an unfortunate fact about finitude. Um, I am thinking about a project that I want to do next about a food writer called MFK Fisher, who was writing in the 1950s, and thinking more broadly about, so she wrote this book during um, rationing during the Second World War um, about how to live on rations. And um, sh she thought that you could live well on little. And so the, the food writing about that is something I'm really interested in and looking forward to working on more next, hopefully. OK, I'm going to come with my own question now. Um, I was very interested to hear about Merton's um, changing the seeds of contemplation to the yeah. new seeds of contemplation. I happen to have that book myself. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my question has to do with whether he was self-consciously bringing the issues of poverty and justice and things into his understanding of the natural environment, or whether they both surfaced at the same time, mm -hmm. or whether the poverty issue came first. because. In the, in the Roman Catholic tradition, at least, eco-theology emerged after thinking uh, a discussion or more focus on social justice. Yeah. So if you like, and then it got woven in, if yeah. you like, later. Yeah. So I wonder whether for Merton, it was um, the natural world came first and then the other was, because I think that does actually make a difference, even though he ended up saying those two are very closely intertangled, which yeah. is very, very important, and yeah. also is true of Laudato Si, as yeah. you mentioned. But what, was there any kind of or priority for him, or in historically, in the way he thought about these things, in the way it sort of unfolded? Because yeah, that I, may also touch on that question of the spirituality and the theology behind his con political concerns. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, and I think it has to do with um, how yeah. ecological knowledge came to people in that period. So he experienced reading Silent Spring as a revolution in his actual knowledge of how the world works. Before that, he didn't know that ecology worked like that. And that was true of so many Americans, and people in other places too. She, she described to them in a new way that they, they just didn't have access to before, what ecology is, why it matters that things that happen to insects and birds also affect us. Um, and without that knowledge, people didn't have the, we, eco-theology developed later because we had to come and grow in understanding. Um, and, and you see that playing out in his own life. And in Reading Silent Spring, he writes to her about having used DDT himself at the monastery. Mm -hmm. And he's just horrified to mm -hmm. learn what it is mm -hmm. because people didn't know. So, anyone else on the from the floor would like to ask? Yes, thank you so much. So, I'm just following up one of your uh, sorry, uh, following up one of the things you said about uh, Walden and Thoreau, uh, because there is of course an opposition there between civilization and nature, so leaving civilization to, to live in nature. Um, where do you see the kind of the, the interaction there? With, with, with community, with, with, the, with, the, mm. with the bigger society? Is it through his writings mm. or through his ideas? Mm. Uh, or is there a kind of, well, at least in the history afterwards, could there be a kind of political theology working, coming out from, from these ideas? And, and what would be the, the form of that th theology, so to speak? Mm. Maybe difficult to answer. But. So on the, on the first issue, um, where's the interaction? And Thoreau's life in the woods. The first chapter of the book tries to describe Thoreau not as um, leaving society, but as leaving one and joining another. Um, there's this famous passage from Walden uh, about um, marching to the beat of a different drummer. And people often, we, the idiom in English that we often use when we want to say someone is different from everyone else is we say someone marches to the beat of their own drum. But Thoreau did not write that you march to the beat of your own drum. He said, you march to the beat of a different drummer. And, and that means that there's more than one band you might join. So the point is that in moving to Walden Pond, he's saying, conquered, elite conquered society isn't the society I want to be part of right now. This other thing is the thing I'm going to try to learn something from. And in the chapter, I argue that it includes um, uh, creatures and places and a variety of uh, other inhabitants, um, 
including these uh, formerly enslaved people whose uh, spirits were believed to occupy the woods in the period that Thoreau lived there. So I want to sort of retrain our eyes on the society Thoreau thought he was joining, not the one that he's departing from. Um, and then whether it, it, uh, there's a political theology to be developed from it. I mean, in the book, I try to describe this thing called political asceticism and the reasons that it, it might be an important idea, uh, that it might help us understand lots of cases of ascetic practice better, to situate them in the societies that they're refusing and joining. Um, I don't know if that constitutes a political theology or not, but we can talk more about that later. <laughs> okay. Call. Thank you, Alda. Um, my question would be, perhaps, uh, do you see in Thoreau's work uh, a link, perhaps, with the community of uh, planetary boundaries and degrowth, where this concern of the limits and basically why do we need growth, uh, illimited growth, in a, whether it's in a finite planet. That would be one way, but with a secular, and then a uh, secular community, um, but also perhaps with the um, liberation theology um, part uh, of, like uh, Nasi Aguria, the Jesuit in, in El Salvador, who worked under the idea of the civilization of poverty, and which really resonates a little uh, with some of the, the tenets that, that you've mentioned. I'm, w I'm wondering those two links. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thoreau was responding, let me make sure I remember both of those. Thoreau was responding to what he took to be a punishing form of asceticism among his towns, the townsmen um, around him. He, he thought that the drive to acquisition was bad for them. He saw them living indebted and uh, for that reason um, required to work more than he thought was necessary. And so he set about trying to see whether, what it would look like to uh, refuse that kind of growth mindset, say. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. But, um, and so I do, I mean, I, the contemporary economic stuff is not my expertise. But, but it seems really important to recognize that there are limits to a finite planet and to find ways that uh, modern economies can recognize that those people's work is very important, I think. Um, about liberation theology, I think I want to learn more about this person in particular from you. It seems to me that, that the questions Thoreau was addressing um, Poverty looks different in, lot, in different places, and it has a different purpose in different places. Um, and so I've been um, myself very interested in the specific context that Thoreau was talking about and to and from. Um, but it does seem that liberation theology has a, a, a much bigger picture of, of those uh, the variety of locations in which poverty uh, comes about and the meanings that it has for different people in different places. Um, Tim, is there other online questions? Perhaps we go over to you now for one or two questions on. Well, various questions that have probably been addressed already, particularly about degrowth as a political uh, program. But uh, one that might be interesting is another form of um, what we might call renunciation, which are those who decide, perhaps from a secular perspective, not to have children, birth strikers, and so on, in response to fears of climate catastrophe uh, in the imminent future. Uh, what sort of um, ascetic gesture might we uh, discern there? I, the, I think it's a UK-based uh, person Who's, who's responded to this concern that lots of people have, I think, about the future their, children's will, their children will see. 
I think a lot of people have a very understandable concern about what future their children will live in. And I think for some people, discernment on this topic leads them to believe they should not have children. That seems another form of injustice. So there's the, these activists in the UK, I think, who have this program they call Conceivable Future, which is just a way of saying one of the things we're fighting for when we're trying to limit carbon emissions is, the, is for all people to be able to experience the formation of their families uh, in a way that can imagine a flourishing future for them. That's something I think we really have to fight for. Are there any, oh, there's a question from the back there. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much, such an interesting talk. I was just wondering if you could comment on um, the role that form plays in both Thoreau and Merton literary form, because yeah. I'm thinking about the political implications of their aesthetic choices as well as their aesthetic choices. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for that question. Um, so I'm very interested in the form of the journal in both of these characters. They were just both compulsive writers, couldn't not write everything down that they saw and cared about and thought about and books they read. That makes them, I think, especially exciting to work on. Um, the form of Walden, in particular, I've thought a lot about because I think it has to do with this, with a question about what rhetoric actually persuades people. Um, Walden is really long, and and the first chapter is, I think, kind of boring on purpose. It's like trying to test you. Um, the, the middle, the long middle of the book is all of these passages about what life was like in the woods and how beautiful it was. And I think in that, I, I think that rhetorical form is kind of a, it, it aims to be a seduction to the good. It aims to say there are all these problems, the first chapter is called economy, and it says there are all these problems in our economy, you probably hate them as much as I do. And then the long middle section of the book is, is trying to describe the possibility that we might have another life, a different kind of life. And that, I think he thinks, is the best kind of political persuasion. Like, the best reason for someone to change their mind is that you show them how good their life would be if they did. And I think that's actually a very important political point. Um, which, so the last chapter of that book is about delight. Um, as, a, as a form of moral, motiva mo moral motivation. And, um, and I think Thoreau had that in mind, and, and sort of the book is the evidence of that. The form that the book took shows us that that's one of the things he was trying to do and one of the things that he thought about politics. Um, unless, I think I, yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Um, time for one more question. Um, over to you, Joel. Thank you, Walter. I, I wonder whether you'll see a bit more about what you see in the resources of McIntyre when you brought in for maybe only three or four sentences toward the end. And I'm asking because I was struck by the juxtaposition of Merton and McIntyre, and especially at the very end of After Virtue, where he says the, the concern is not really so much that the barbarians are at the gate, but that the barbarians are already among us. And that's always struck me as kind of a supreme kind of confidence in his own moral position. And then over against that, you also mentioned Merton's notion of uh, um, going to Rachel Carson, writing to Rachel Carson, and saying, I had no idea the kind of humility that, that he brings. And so that seems like a very, very different sort of modeling. And you've just left those two right there together. And I wonder whether you say a bit more about that, please. Thanks. Um... I think there's a lot in McIntyre that's very useful just for thinking about how, um, what traditions are good for, how they're important to everyone for thinking through anything. Um, I worry that that gesture at the end of After Virtue describes a, a form of, of life that closes in on itself. Um, in confidence and also without looking to resources outside. Um, and I, one of the reasons that I'm quite interested in Merton is just this 
insatiable curiosity that the truth we we will we can find truth in lots of places, um, and it does require the kind of humility you're describing, I think, to sort of look around. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody, very much. But most of all, thank you so much, Alda, for that really, really stimulating and powerful lecture. So um, we're, we've come to the end of our formal time now, but we do have drinks, and I'm sure there are plenty of people here who've got questions simmering and would like to, to ask Alda something. So there was, will be an opportunity for that now, but you're warmly invited to the, to the drinks, um, that is, if you're in person um, <laughs> uh, afterwards. Um, but just, let's just show our appreciation once more for this. Fantastic. Thank you.